Water is life. Every drop of blood that flows within you, every tear that falls from your eye, let us be one with the cycle, the never-ending current of life. Water moving through our bodies, water moving through our land. We meet here in celebration of the River Wye that rises from the far distant hills of Plinowen, a trickle of life and movement on a grassy slope tenderly coming forth and feeling the tug of the sea, spilling down the slopes, abundance greening the earth around, obeying gravity and the siren song of deeper waters. As it runs, it is met with drips and drops and rivulets. Other streams rush forth to join it, coming together as we are coming together, creating a legacy to be proud of. Open your heart and hear her call. Without water, there is no life. Good evening and welcome. And thanks very much indeed for coming tonight. Um, 500 people in here. Uh, obviously there's great passion about the river and uh, what's happening about the river. And uh, we just hope tonight from our presenters that we will get a good clear answer to where we're going and to see the river restored to full health as soon as possible. So for the past three years we've been campaigning to promote a recovery of the health of rivers throughout the Wye catchment. And this has included gathering data via our citizen science network which is now available for all to see via the Wyeviz platform on the internet. And it's also involved campaigning, talking with all parties involved and informing the world about what's going on. And that's what's brought us together this evening. So enjoy the evening. I didn't introduce ourselves by the way. I'm Mike Dunsby and this is Nick Day. And uh, we will now bring up, like to ask Nitla Kutcher uh, to come and join us on the stage. Nitla is a freelance journalist, uh, investigative reporter, writing for papers such as The uh, Guardian through to The Times. So I will now hear, leave the evening to Nitla. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for being here, everyone. It's amazing that you all turned out on a Friday night, and it shows the huge passion there is for this sacred and precious river, whose representative is here tonight. The river itself is here. Um, thank you so much to the Save the Wide people and Kim and Bay for bringing that to us. So. Tonight, we've got an absolutely packed programme, and we have a lot of speakers. So we have people from environmental charities and organisations who are going to set out their ambition for what they think needs to happen to actually restore the why. We've got farmers as well that are going to explain what actions they're voluntarily taking, and companies in the supply chain talking about the voluntary actions they're taking. And then finally, we're going to have the environmental agencies and regulators on the stage. So my job is to be collating points made throughout the night, and then questioning people throughout the evening. So some of our speakers will be followed up by a few questions from me afterwards. So you know, um, we did also invite government representatives here tonight. We didn't even get a response from Environment Secretary Steve Barclay, sadly, or any officials at DEFRA, which is pretty appalling. We did, yes, appropriate booze. Um, we will feed them back. And we did invite the Welsh Government as well. To be fair, Mark Drakeford, Julie James and Leslie Griffiths all wrote back to say they couldn't attend, but they're still not here, which is a shame. Um, and we still await the government's plan for the why. So the former Environment Secretary, Therese Kofi, promised that by last autumn. That's now six months late and counting. But we think there's going to be a lot of ideas tonight that should go into that plan. So we will be recording this evening's event and making that available to people who can't be here. I also wanted to let you know that this event really follows two previous events from last year. The first was an event held by the Wildlife Trusts at Hay Castle, which was a round table with all, lots of the people you'll hear tonight in attendance, plus the supermarkets, including Tesco and Waitrose. 
And that group of stakeholders agreed some really important kind of common ground, or at least nobody in the room at the time voiced any objection to these points. And these points were, number one, that we have to say that this is peak worst. Okay, the river can't be allowed to get worse from here. We can't keep adding to the nutrient load on the river from this point. We have to start bringing it down. The second point that was made at that meeting was that if the Y was a school or a hospital, it would be put into special measures. So that means we need to do something beyond what we've been doing so far, special measures. Things like, I take that to mean a water protection zone or other kinds of regulatory frameworks that would enable more action to be taken on the ground. And finally, the refocus report was right at the centre of that discussion. So the refocus report was by some scientists that were looking at phosphorus flows into the catchment, most of which coming in the form of animal feed, most of which go into land in the form of manure. And they made some key recommendations that included reducing livestock numbers in the catchment, also exporting more nutrient manure out of the catchment, and reducing overall fertiliser use and chemical use pesticides, things like that. So that was kind of a common ground, which I thought was important to reiterate today as where we start from. Then there was an, uh, another event hosted by Herefordshire Council in November called Building Bridges Over Troubled Waters, where various farming groups and companies shared the actions they're voluntarily taking. And because tonight we're not going to go into some of the technologies, because I didn't want to repeat the content of the Heritage Council event, I did want to let you know that there are some interesting technological innovations in the kind of poultry space. So, for full fairness, Joe Hilditch, who's a farmer at Wooten Farms in Herefordshire, she has 600,000 birds, and she has invested £3 million in building three big burners that take her chicken manure from her 600,000 birds, burn it, create heat for her chicken units, turns that manure into kind of an ash that's only 10% of the weight of all the chicken manure, makes it much more exportable, and that ash gets turned into pellets that can be sold as phosphorus fertiliser easily outside the catchment. That is a really interesting innovation that is reducing the nutrient burden on the Y now. Similarly, other, there are other projects looking at phosphate stripping on anaerobic digesters to take the phosphorus out of the digestate to stop it being spread to land, and again, make it more exportable out of the catchment. That is really welcome innovation, but I don't think that technical solutions are the panacea, and we do have to ask wider questions about the fact that those things don't address the feed that's coming from South America and the soy, or anything else. So there's wider questions about sustainable farming. But I wanted to let you know that that progress is being made by individuals, as well as from the companies you'll hear from tonight. So, without further ado, Herefordshire Council hosted that last event, so tonight we wanted to give the opportunity to Monmouthshire County Council to explain what their council is doing to take action to restore the river. So our first speaker is Catherine Mabey. First challenge, reaching the podium. Whoa. An awful lot of people, and I can't see you because it's a very bright light. Um, okay, firstly, I want to say thank you to Friends of the Lower Wye for organising the event, and secondly, and importantly, to voice the support and the commitment of Monmouthshire County Council for the work that they do. When I first became a county councillor nearly two years ago and joined the Cabinet, one of the first questions I asked was, who do I work with on rivers and river pollution? The answer wasn't a simple one. Um, I mean, in actual fact, um, there is no one, or off one officer or service with responsibility for this. Officers were focused initially on briefing me on the core council responsibilities in my cabinet portfolio. My portfolio is called Climate Change and Environment, but it's really extensive, I soon found out. My role is, includes roads, fixing the potholes, public transport, active travel, street cleaning and lighting, grounds maintenance, waste management, flooding, and biodiversity and decarbonisation. I managed to persuade someone else to take on public toilets. Thank you, Sarah, if you're here. I had to learn really quickly, and just as I started to really understand what I could do, we were hit with a, an immense financial shock. With the inflation that followed the Trust government, it did rather clip my wings. But on the positive side, I found council officers immediately receptive and interested in the issue of river pollution and keen to do whatever they can. What we have is a dedicated nature and green infrastructure team who cheered me for pushing nature recovery as a priority as well as climate change. And I've initiated cross, regular cross-departmental updates on rivers across nature and green infrastructure, flooding and planning. 
and that's helped us to maintain a holistic mindset and to make the best use of our very limited resources. So what else are we doing as a county council? We've highlighted nature recovery, river pollution and regenerative agriculture, as well as action on climate change in the council's corporate and community plan for the first time. I'm also making sure it's the case in all of our other strategies as we work our way through developing these. Of particular relevance is the development of a food strategy, asset strategy and flood risk strategy. I knew I was going to be boring talking about strategies, I'm so sorry, but that is kind of what we do. On flooding, we're working on a number of natural flood management projects across the county with relevance to soil and nutrient management and that's a little bit more exciting. We've committed to making sure that green infrastructure and active travel are embedded in new housing development schemes as well as the required sustainable urban drainage, which will avoid some of the worst mistakes that have been made in the past with impermeable surfaces. We think in terms of catchments rather than administrative boundaries, and the County Council is a partner in the catchment groups on both the Wye and Musk rivers, and we've been proactive in highlighting river pollution as an urgent issue with Welsh Government, and we work with colleagues in Powys, Herefordshire, Forrester Dean to improve cross-border cooperation, regardless of DEFRA apparently putting any cross-border cooperation into the too difficult box. <laughs> for myself, being part of a group of citizen scientists with the Friends of the Lower Wye, thank you for teaching me, who regularly test the river, this has really helped me to keep my feet on the ground while doing what I can at strategic level. Testing the river at the same location weekly really focuses your attention on how the river changes with the weather and what's happening upstream. I test the mono in Skenfrith, a small village which has been flooded in the past, so a rising river level is frightening, but at the same time the river is a real source of beauty and enjoyment. So I'm very conscious as a councillor that the rivers represent so many things for us, a rich source of biodiversity that must be protected, a place to fish, to paddle, to swim, a place of beauty and tranquility, but also a source of flooding and a physical barrier with limited crossing places. And with infrastructure in my portfolio, I'm really conscious of the vulnerability and the need and how precious those crossing places are. The rivers are our arteries and our veins. We need them so that they can get sick and they need to be cared for. As a council, we've signed up to the Rivers and Oceans Pledge, progressing from the declaration of a climate emergency to recognition of a nature emergency too. We're just one part of the jigsaw and almost everything we do in working for change is part of wider partnerships. But we make sure that our contribution is always pushing in the right direction. What I can promise is that we'll keep on pushing and using what influence we have to save our rivers. Things have moved forward in the last two years, but it is in no way enough. And I call upon both the statutory agencies and the commercial interests here to get this sorted. We will always support you in doing the right thing, but we will join with all the other voices in calling out when it's not good enough. Thank you. You might have seen him on the news rather a lot in the last few weeks because he took the Environment Agency to court for alleged failure to protect the river. His job is Please, you're intruding on my five minutes. Sure. Uh, so, um, unlike the vast majority of people in this room, the River Wye has only been an important part of my life for a very short period of time. So, I mean, starting in January, 2001 when I set up River Action, having watched with absolute horror and dismay what happened the year before when the river lost all its ranculus and that horrific algal bloom engulfed it from its source to, the, to, to its mouth. Um, and as, but as Nicholas said, there has been progress. There's no question there's been progress. Campaigns, I know a lot about campaigns, that was, that was my world before I got involved in this. Um, and a campaign goes through a cycle. To be a successful campaign, you start with, you've got to overcome denial from the perpetrators, you get them to accept the problem, but then you've got to get into the solutions. And I think when, when we started, denial was everywhere. Um, 
National Resources Wales, Natural Resources Wales, had their infamous statement saying they saw no evidence of, of the poultry industry's contribution to pollution and so on. But now we, we're going to hear, I think, this evening, some really interesting things from, from the Avara scheme. Um, I hope we're going to hear something around the egg industry, what they might be doing. We've got groups of farmers who are doing excellent things. But the problem is, we now need solutions. And, and we could have an absolutely perverse situation where we have people, organisations that are, because they're doing the right thing, they end up losing their business because other people are still allowed to pollute the river. And that's why we were in court, we were in court two weeks ago. Because we have regulations. For example, in England, there is a critical regulation that says you cannot oversaturate land with nutrients. But the why? Several times the levels of permitted phosphorus are here in the soils of the why. And guess where it all ends up? It goes down the hill and it ends up in the river. So the law has to be enforced. And for all the wonderful things that individual people are doing on their own volition, without a really watertight regulatory regime, it's pretty pointless. Um, and so if I have one message today, it is about regulation, regulation, regulation. Um, we were in court. I've got a couple of pieces of evidence we submitted. This is, whoops, this is a farm inspection report, um, which we, we got through disclosure. This particular farmer, the phosphate levels in the soils are 10 times the permitted amount. That is just a total time bomb for diffuse agricultural pollution. But guess what it says? We're not doing anything about it. But please try harder. This is the template letter which we presented in court, which, which, which if you do one of four things, or one or more of four things, which are basically, you're putting too much phosphorus into the soil, you're putting too much nitrogen into the soil, your, your nutrient management plan shows that you are polluting, that these are emitting into a water course. It then says, in line with the statutory guidance issued to us, issued to us we will not be taking any further action. But please try harder. And you might want to consider some of these things. I'm sorry, that is not regulation. That is voluntary opt-out of the law. And that is what's going to happen, what's got to happen. And that's just at a basic level. That's just daily obeying the law. If you were a motorist speeding down the motorway, you would not... Uh, uh, how would that work if, the, if the, the traffic police, all they could do was tap you on the windscreen and say, I'm terribly sorry, you're driving recklessly, but we can't enforce the law, but please, you know, we advise you to drive a bit slower. Is that going to change people's behaviour? Of course it isn't. Why should some people be able to operate and do their business outside of the law? And that's just at the very base level. As Nicola said, if this was a school that had been pronounced unfavourable, unfavourable and declining as the why was last May by, the, by Natural England. If that was a school or a hospital or, or a rail franchise, they would be put straight into emergency measures um, and, and you know, some sort of special measures regime. And that is what has to happen. And there's so many obvious things. And I, and I think some of the people who are going to, my colleagues, my five minutes is probably almost up. Well, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Um, and, and I think hopefully we're going to hear some of those ideas more specifically. But we have to have regulation and it has to be enforceable, and it, people can't opt out of it, and it's got to be more than just giving people friendly advice on how to do better. Thank, Thank you. River campaigner, and we're very glad to have you with us. It was going to be Guy Lily Adams, who is the in house solicitor. He has had car trouble tonight, so Nick has stepped in to take over. So, thank you, Nick. Right, thank you, everybody, and welcome. And I, the great thing is, with the lights, I can't see any of you, but <laughs> I can hear you. That's what we want. Okay, following on from, from what Charles said, what do we do about the River Wye? Can I have the next oh, slide? Yeah, I'll do Sorry. That. Is that, is, yeah. What do I do with this? Yeah, I think he does it. Oh, I do it, do I? Okay. Right, well, okay, next slide. Well, we've, this will basically summarise the problem, as Charles has so eloquently put it. We've basically got 
far too much phosphate nutrient in, in the Y Valley. Everybody understands what the problem, everybody now accepts as a problem. At one stage, the, uh, the EA and, and, and um, Natural Resources Wales seem we're in denial. Now Natural Resources Wales accepts that chicken farming is a major cause of the problem. There are other problems which we can, we can discuss um, at other times, and when, where, when we were last in court arguing about the, uh, the sewage industry. However, time doesn't really permit to cover that one. Okay, so we know there's a problem, there's been great research done. Right, how do we get the next slide, please? I mean, it's common sense what needs to be done. Application rates of manures and ways to land should match the capacity of the crop to utilise the nutrients. Complete common sense, you'd think everybody would be doing it, but they don't. Now, can I have a look? And where do you think that came from? The next slide. That came from the Code of Good Agricultural Practice. That was published in 1985. It's been repeated so 40 years ago. It's been repeated time and again in various other um, codes of guidance. And it's now codified into the farming rules for water. So it is now law. Next slide. And also, interestingly, under the... Uh, Control of Pollution Act, it's an offence to cause or knowingly permit any poisonous, noxious or polluting matter to enter any stream or controlled waters. The reasonable farmer test is that if a farmer follows the, the, the uh, code of practice, the, the farming rules for water, they are covered. If they don't, they, they should be, frequently or not, should be sanctioned. So, I mean, the next big question is, why on earth has all this been allowed to happen when we know and have known for 40 years what we need to do? Next slide. Where did it all go wrong? Well, we've had the guidance and we've had next to no enforcement. The Environment Agency, you will be pleased to know, have now increased the number of farming inspectors. It's still inadequate. It's a step in the right direction, but it's still inadequate. Um, before we started complaining about this um, in, 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 in four or five years ago, inspections were once every 200 years, so that was hardly a, uh, an inducement to um, anybody to do anything. That has now fallen to something like once every 25 years. That, I'm afraid, is still not, in our view, enough. And it clearly is that the rivers are telling us, our fish are telling us, it ain't right. The... And in particular, in regard to the, 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 the why, there's been a failure of the so-called um, environmental impact assessments. They don't take account of the cumulative impact of, of building, of, of give, giving permission to more and more of the IPUs. They look at these, these things in isolation. That's completely nuts. You're adding to an overall burden that's already out of control. That, that, that needs to be much more tightly policed. The... Um, the, the failure of um, larger units to set conditions on waste, that is now beginning, we see some, some, some of the farmers fantastically are beginning to tackle that issue, but sadly again, nowhere near enough. And the bird limit for the permitting regulations is set far too high. Basically, we would like to see that to change. And we need enforcement, we need directions from central government. And, and the next slide will give us the specifics on this. Firstly, I'd just like to say a word for the, the work that's been done at the moment in terms of mitigation by the Wynus Foundation and many other organisations, Wildlife Trust, that, and, 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 and Enlightened Farmers, that's fantastic. But, I'm afraid to say, we do need to have a regulatory baseline to have some hard incentives to ensure that all farmers are doing the same thing. The problem with rivers and water is it gets everywhere and it only takes one or two not to follow the right, the, the right way of doing things to wreck the entire, the, the entire catchment. So you cannot escape from a regulation. And what's, what's required? Well, the regulators, as I said, need to revise the permits, to set conditions to require the export of excess nutrients from the catchment, which probably means, given the, the, the fact that the, the, the Y Valley is super saturated, basically all wastes. And it's not good enough just to move them from Wales to England. And all of the comments I'm making should apply in a, in a joined up way on, on the river. 
Fish don't understand national boundaries, and ni neither, frankly, do I when it comes to these the, the river basins and catchments. And then central government needs to reduce the, um, the, bird, the bird level for permitting. Currently says, I think, at around 40,000. Frankly, I'd like to see virtually every IPU covered by, by, by the permitting process. And then how do, how do we pay for this? Well, we set permit charges. Seems perfectly rational. Um, you're, using, you're using up the, 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 the producer, egg producers are using up a scarce resource, the environment. They should be paying for it. And that, the, those, the, those, those charges will cover the costs of inspection, monitoring and enforcement. Things that absolutely need to be carried out in any regulatory environment. So there you have it. That is a really straightforward, straightforward set, of, set of requirements. Thank you so much. saying there that that's right at the moment you only require an environmental permit for a poultry unit if you've got more than 40,000 birds and so the environment agency uh, they, they inspect units that have environmental permits but I put in a freedom of information request to say over the last four years how many poultry units have you inspected that weren't permitted i.e. how many poultry units with less fewer than 40,000 birds have you gone to look at the answer was zero none in four years even though numerous problems have been raised about pollution coming from free range egg units and small egg units. Traditionally, egg, egg sheds are like 16,000, maybe 12,000, but lots of sites are up to 39,000 birds, and none of that is getting checked on the English side. That may be changing, we're going to hear from the EA later on, but that was the answer to the Freedom of Information request that I put in. Um, so that's the point the guy's making. Unless these things are permitted, they don't get inspected. So we might need to change that permit threshold. Um, okay, I'm now calling up two farmers to the stage. We've got Cherry Taylor, who's from Ace Monmouth and is a market gardener, and we have Martin Williams, who's speaking on behalf of Farm Heritageshire. So Cherry will speak first, and Martin can. Oh, poor Martin is doing an epic slide through a gate. Um, well done, Martin. Heroic. Uh, yes, yeah, please welcome. Him to the stage. Yes, gosh, it is bright. Right, thank you very much everybody for coming tonight. So, uh, my name is Cherry Taylor, and um, I am a volunteer with um, ACE Monmouth, which is a climate emergency group. Um, when I'm not volunteering for that, I have a small market garden and do various other bits and pieces. Um, so, uh, if I could have the next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to talk, I think, I think also I'm sort of one foot in the farming camp, but I wouldn't call myself a farmer, but um, a, a market gardener I certainly am, and a, a lot of what I do overlaps with regenerative agriculture. Can I just step out of the light for a minute, and just can I have a show of hands to see who's heard of regenerative agriculture? Oh my lord, <laughs> that's fantastic, okay. Put your hands up if you're doing regenerative agriculture. Woo, that's good too. Brilliant. Okay. So, um, regenerative agriculture has these five principles, and um, they are all about soil. So, um, it's really important uh, that we look after our soil, and uh, this, all of these, each individual principle will contribute if it's practiced, will contribute towards reducing the runoff um, from fields and therefore taking fertilisers and other things with it. Um, and it will also um, result in uh, better water absorption into the soil. And what underpins all of this is something that actually isn't talked about an awful lot uh, in farming, as, as is my experience to date. And that is, it's all about the soil biology. So quite often, or most of the time, people talk about soil chemistry, and they talk about fertilisers, and all of the problems you hear, we're all talking about chemicals in the rivers, but actually those chemicals are detrimental to soil life. 
And so the more chemicals we put on the soil, uh, the worse the soil becomes and the more uh, difficult it is for salt, uh, water to go down into the ground and the easier it, it is for runoff to happen. So that's really important. So can I have the next slide, please? So this is um, a... So here you've got uh, a soil profile, two soil profiles, uh, which um, I, I was part of a workshop recently with a guy called Niels Caulfield, who's all about grazing management and, and regen ag. And you can see that they're, they're quite different. Would everybody agree they're quite, they look quite different? Yeah. 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 So the one uh, nearest me, uh, that was taken just below the hedgerow, so right on the edge of the field. Um, the other one was taken in the middle of the field. And you can see, I'm going to point a little bit here. So you can see here that it's got these lovely lumps and, and little, uh, these, these are aggregates, soil aggregates, and they are made by soil biology. And um, it's got lots of roots in it, and it's darker brown, that's all the carbon in it. And then over here in the field, you can see it's a little bit like that one, just at the very top. And then it gets a bit more blocky, and then much more blocky down, down the bottom. And when we took this, this was in October or November, I can't quite remember, this year we'd had a lot of rain. And the bottom of this soil sample was drier than the top. And this, I think, is really fundamental to, um, to some of the problems that we've got. Can you stay behind the mic, just so people can hear you? Okay, sorry. So I think this is really fundamental to some of the problems that we're, we're having. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so one of the things that I'm involved with is a, um, a regen project. So this was, it's being managed through ACE Monmouth, and we have three farms being mentored by Regen Ben, uh, Ben Taylor Davis, uh, for 12 months, helping three farms to transition to Regen Ag. So hopefully, they will be um, uh, going through this journey, learning how to manage their soils better, um, and in addition to that, in parallel to that, we have this group called Talk Farm Regen Momishi. It's a Facebook group, it's a discussion group, um, and a, a farmer is running that group, and it's got 281 farmers on it at the moment. It's only started in late July last year. And in addition to that, we have lots of events. That soil workshop was one of them. So local farmers... The, the idea is that we've got, okay, we've got three farms, we want to share their journey, we want to encourage more farmers to explore Regen uh, and find out about it. And I'm probably going to get a double ping in a minute. Next slide, please. So these are the people, the, the organisations that are supporting the project, the mentoring project and the Facebook group and the, and the events that are associated with it. Um, and so huge thanks to those organisations. And my last little bit is, if you want to find out more about Regen, this is a brilliant read, and I'd highly recommend it. Thank you very much. Yeah, and welcome to Martin Williams, who's uh, co-chair of Farm Herefordshire, and there's also, happens to be, he's talking with his Farm Herefordshire hat on, but he is also the NFU County Rep for Herefordshire as well. Hello everybody, I'm, hopefully my head isn't shining onto you. <laughs> nice to see you all here, I'm so glad I'm representing Farm Herefordshire tonight because as a farmer I'd feel pretty at a low ebb after listening to those first few chapters. Um, I put, oh, we're on a, a, yeah. a separate, so we missed the, we tried to change the slide. I heard an interesting quote last night actually and I tried to change the slides today and it was from Winston Churchill and it's just like, there are 500 people in here, but there's a great big elephant in the room as well, in the formation of a chicken. And I, I'll run the quote by you. It's something along the lines of, there will be a time when um, we won't need to keep a chicken. We will be able to make the sum of its parts elsewhere. And we had a talk last night at the Hereford Ag Club. I know a couple of people here that were there. And it struck me as quite a great slide. I, I tried to put it in, but the tech didn't work. So anyway, there we go. But it, it's quite a... 
the big thing about that was it was 1931 that he said that. So he's 100 years ahead of his game, and we're still not there. So, Farm Herefordshire, what does Farm Herefordshire do in this arena? Farm Herefordshire is a group of 13 now, uh, partner organisations. And we all meet uh, in Hereford, and we're, we put our bags down and our agendas at the door, and we go in with one common goal. It's a fantastic organisation because it's based on collaboration. And collaboration is the key to everything that will sort out what's going on in the river. We're not playing a blame game. And we shouldn't. Everyone has a part to play. And you're saying, oh, we've got to blame them. No, we haven't. Let's sort it out properly, grown-up discussion, and that's how we'll deal with it. So looking at Farm Herefordshire, I've only got five minutes, so I could stand here all night. I quite enjoy it, actually, as you can probably tell. Um, so in 2023, on the board there on the screen, you can see some of the things that the partnership actions within Farm Herefordshire managed to achieve. And within that, there are 850 farms that had an advisory uh, visit from one of the partners in that group. There were 200 one-to-one -one inspections. There were 23 knowledge transfer events across the county within the last 12 months. And six projects were developed in partnership through Farm Herefordshire, including the Wisecapes Landscape Recovery bid, which was a bid. It's now an item. So things are changing through collaborative work. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. So during 2023, we also ran a little survey. And you're going to say, yeah, but nobody responded. They didn't know. Nobody turned up at all. But actually, they did. Uh, it's difficult to put a number on it. I think there are about 240 respondents. And yes, there's 1,800 farms in Herefordshire. But it represented 43,000 hectares of farmland in the county by by the document. Okay, so yes, you can pick holes in it, let's pick holes in it, but let's look at the positive. It wasn't done before, it's now being done. It was 180,000 hectares in Herefordshire, and 90% of those polled, those polled, uh, thought it was important to reduce their pea reduction. The message is getting out there through knowledge exchange, through these sort of events, through the farm events that we're doing, and farmers are actually changing their thought process. We talked earlier, I heard earlier about um, we're over producer, over sticking muck on everywhere. I heard yesterday of a farmer who was persuading his agronomist to, that he wanted to put less potato phosphate down the spout, less than is recommended for his maximised crop. So there are changes happening within the community and it's fantastic work that Farm Herefordshire partners all go together and that's what's coming out the other end. So. You can see those stats, I don't need to explain them all to you. You can see them, you can read them, hopefully. If you can't, you can borrow my glasses. Um, if you want them afterwards, you're more than welcome. If we go on to the next slide before that ting goes, because I've got tinnitus, I might not miss it. So the key to everything is in collaboration. We've got to collaborate. Let's not be divisive. Let's all help one another create the solution. Within agriculture, I'm not going to stand here and say, we, oh no, we can't do this, we can't do that. There are certain elements in agriculture that we're still learning. Agriculture is a massive word. If you split it into two, the biggest part of that word is the culture. And culture takes time to change. Charles has spoken earlier about, the rules are the rules. <coughs> but the rules came in in 2018, I think, Farm Rules for Water. They weren't actually put in place hard and fast, or supposedly hard and fast, not hard enough for Charles, until 2020. And the culture has to change. So that takes some time. So just bear with us, because as you can see, through collaboration, it's happening. There's knowledge gaps that we're, we're finding through the farm heritage work. There's drain testing. And we are trying to do our little bit of city science stuff in the drains to find out what's going in the soil. There are a lot of little projects that are happening through the partners to make that work. And the key to farming is farmers are grumpy, they don't believe, oh, I don't want to do that. I'm one, I'm a farmer, I'm really awful. But when you're shown something and you're given some data, it takes you a couple of times to hear it before you'll believe it. And so we have to ensure that what we're doing is measured to be able to give that data both to you and to the farmers involved. Because 
Those are the ways that we're going to sort this out. It's not through fighting with each other. Thank you. Thanks, Martha. I've got to just sit down now. So no. you can, well, you have no, to no, I'll, I'll, I'll stand. Okay, great. Right. It's not for long. Um, I just, one of the slides said that 57% of the survey respondents identified barriers to making changes on their farm. Indeed. And I wondered, what kind of barriers are they? Like, some, how do we break them down? Some of it was around funding, majority was around funding, I think. Uh, when you get a grant, you have to match fund it, maybe, sometimes. Some of it's around dad issues, maybe. There are all sorts of issues around it. We didn't sort of... Okay. I think identify individuals, but I, there are certain. Is it things like if someone need they know they need a slurry store, but they don't have money to build one, or is it that they want to farm in a more well, regenerative way, but they need more money to well, be able to transition? We're always asking for money, aren't we? But the planning is a great issue. The planning portals in the council and the legislation around that. How do you get? Some people have been waiting for planning permissions for three and four years. I don't know. It's all because of the moratorium, and we know why. But sometimes these things need to be looked at sympathetically, maybe. When you can see a, a benefit uh, to, a, to an industry or benefit to a farm to improve pollution, why would you hold up the planning? Why would you do that? But sometimes that's being done. So barriers are all sorts of things. When you're talking about working together, it's just that if there's things that a farmer is trying to get something done that would make things better for the river, that surely there's ways of working with like, right. the amplified groups like Friends of the River Y to try and push for yeah. the good things to happen. Yeah. Well, don't tell anybody, but I talk to Nicola quite a lot. And she's my arch enemy. I talk to Charles quite a lot. He's my arch enemy. Don't tell anybody when you leave the room. And so... <laughs> When, you, when you're doing that, we can work together to make things happen, and that, that's part of collaboration, isn't it? Yeah, and so I guess, although you're talking this Farm Herefordshire, has the National Farmers Union got a plan to restore the Y? Are they, are they really actively telling their members about the farming rules for water? Because they were implemented in 2018. This is six years later. Culture change might take a long time, but we haven't got any more time. It's I mean, very difficult for me to speak on a national yeah, stage, sure. a national person. There, there is... There is um, information available through the NFU website. There is also, uh, the NFU are part of Farm Herefordshire, so they are coming to that party. So I'm not willing to speak on, and they're not a regulator, that's the other thing. No. But I'm not going to sure. speak on behalf of them. Okay, that's great. And I guess the other thing just to mention is that in the background to all of this, there's this new like No Farmers, No Food movement. Yes. Um, which I think lots of people must be following, and there does seem to be a pushback by some within that against kind of environmental regulation or against some of the measures to, you know, in Wales have more trees and have more flood mitigation. So you obviously were, you were a signatory of the, you kind of had a quote from the press release, and the press release itself took an anti net zero position. I just wanted to ask you, where do you fit? Are you still pro? If we can get funding, do you want to do more environmentally good measures 100%, on farms? 100%. Yeah, I just wanted to give you a chance this is, to... This is me, the farmer. Now. Yeah, what yeah, needs, to happen, what needs yeah. to happen? Because there's a lot of people are worried now that there's this pushback, even though we haven't yet even implemented... Well, I was, talking, I was talking to Simon earlier about it, Simon yeah. Robbins, then, yeah, in the dark, sitting in the shadows like the black shadow. Um, <laughs> I was saying, it's an unusual position we're in at the moment. I talked about agriculture. Agriculture is a production. You go into Wales. I watched a couple of years ago... 800 people at 8 o'clock at night watching a man shear a sheep. That's not normal, surely. <laughs> but it happens in Wales because of that community spirit and that closeness to production. It, it's like inbred, and that culture is a massive part. So, going back to what your question is, England, we've been fortunate in some respects in some of the infrastructure grants, some of the the time we've had to learn through uh, CS agreements, we've been more used to significant catchment sensitive farming. Catchment sensitive farming. Yeah. We've been we've been really used to it over time. So, a them and us situation has sort of occurred where we're in a better position, maybe, and better funded yeah. than the Welsh side. And and I feel sorry for them in in that respect. However, in the common. Uh, want of everyone with the environment and the change in lifestyle and change in food and change in wants, they're have to, going to have to catch up, but it's going to take some time. And I think it's very difficult over there for them. I really do. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. It is true that the Welsh, yeah, the Welsh system hasn't, is definitely underfunded. We might hear about that from our next speakers. Uh, thank you okay. so much, Martin. Thank you, Sherry. Um, welcome, welcome to the stage, Jamie Audley from Herefordshire.
Hampshire Wildlife Trust CEO and James Hitchcock, CEO of the Hampshire Wildlife Trust, who are doing a Wildlife Trust double act. <laughs> yeah, good evening everybody. Great to see so many people here. So, who are we? Uh, we are two wildlife trusts from the eight in the white catchment and we have over 40,000 members. Jamie and I are fairly new, chief of sex, and we have a lot of energy and collaborate very well. Um, rivers are a key part of our strategy, and so what are we doing? We're campaigning, <coughs> we're advocating, and we're engaging in practical delivery to help drive change. James. Thank you, James. So yes, I'm James's partner in crime, deliverer in crime. Some of the specifics, uh, for example, on the, the lug and the lime in the Lingam Brooks, we've been uh, taking stock of what's happening on those uh, streams and rivers, uh, providing advice locally, providing resource to uh, capital investment to change that landscape. Uh, we've been attending some of the AGMs uh, with others to hold the big corporates uh, to account. And increasingly, as Martin mentioned, we'll talk a bit more about it in a second, we're able to do more landscape scale recovery in, part in partnership with others. We're doing some support to adapt to climate change in the Y uh, and indeed supporting the Yscapes programme too. So yeah, what are we doing in Ravisha? And at this point I should say, just look for the removal of that, Ravisha is the middle bit of Paris. And it's a vice county that hasn't been recognised by Welsh Government since 1972. <laughs> However, we press on and we're doing alright. <laughs> so, we've just got um, a campaign and advocacy post funded for three years. Why is that great? Because we're at a crucial time. You've got two elections on both sides of the border coming up and it builds on the work that we've previously done in targeting Welsh Government. You know, we've seen and heard a lot of focus on England. You know, that's needed, but we need to make sure Wales doesn't fall behind in terms of keeping up the pressure, keeping a positive and constructive national conversation to get key change through um, when the time is right within the cycle. What else are we doing? We've just started a two-year project um, on the River Lug. We're collaborating with Herefordshire, as is our want. Um, that's focused on natural flood management. We've got capital budget. We're getting a lot of interest, including from young farmers, who see the change and feel the need for it. That's positive. We're going to use that campaign and advocacy post to give a platform and a voice for those people that are doing good things and do things differently and put that forward. We need to change the conversation just from doom and gloom. We have got Wild and Pen and Farm, where we're mixing free wilding, regenerative agriculture and food systems um, for positive change. We're running a cluster. Um, group of um, farmers engaged in shared learning and a safe space to talk openly. That project is set to extend to about 6,000 acres across the adjacent hills and commons. Hope to have more positive and definitive action um, confirmed on that soon. And then as Jamie said, we've just started a three-year project called Why Act for Climate Change, where we've got officers across the low, well, middle and low wire catchment advising communities and individual landowners on climate resilience measures, trying to seek funding for change. And again, we're getting a lot of interest getting onto farms. So that's some about us. If we look outwards, um, some of the positives we see, uh, a bit of local governance, I uh, forgive the terminology, but the Nutrient Management Board in Herefordshire has got its act together. The Environment Agency, National Resources Wales and the NE uh, have the responsibility to get a plan uh, on nutrient reduction, which we're looking forward to supporting. The Y Catchment Partnership is getting better organised and rejuvenating and has the ambition for a catchment management plan uh, partner delivered by June. Uh, and indeed, the landscape recovery schemes are coming forward. Um, but everything, not everything is positive. Give the headlines on some negatives, just to set the scene further, James. Well, we've heard um, a little bit about the um, lack of funding in, in Wales, and that gap does feel bigger than ever at the moment, especially when you're right on the border. So thank you very much for your patience. That is the only break we'll be having this evening. We will now continue to the, uh, to the end of the... Uh, end of the event. So like I say, I will hand back to James and Jamie of the Wildlife Trust and uh, and thank you. Thank you very much indeed for your patience. Thank you. Well look, um, well firstly really good news that the person is recovering and well. We hope we had no particularly negative impact. Um, thanks for the jokes during the interval. James is going to kick us off. We've got two and a half minutes to go. Yeah, come on then. So let's get back to some positives, but let's just start by saying I've never had that reaction before. I mean, it is often a shock that Ragnar shit doesn't exist. I can only apologise. Right, so wider positives. Farm Cymru is forming. It has some funding. It's going to mirror the work of Farm Herefordshire. That can only be a good thing. 
NRW have their Upper Y um, catchment project, a £5 million project. That should be supported. Often in the past, we've said lots of negative things about NRW, so you know, in return, we've got to say the positive things. Powers County Council have got more staff working on biodiversity and nutrient neutrality than they've had for many years. Again, that means acknowledge they need support. Um, and we've got the election cycle coming up. You know, we've got a chance to champion change, create community champions, mobilise our support base, keep clean water and sustainable, healthy rivers well and truly on the agenda. Brilliant, and I think um, we're supportive of many of the things that other speakers have said, but for our last few minutes, minute uh, indeed, we're going to focus in on corporates and um, the supply chain. Uh, and James is going to kick us off with uh, moving beyond uh, some of the existing practice into regenerative approaches. So it's right, isn't it, that the main focus has been on the most intensive end of production, you know, poultry, where we've seen a lot of growth, potatoes and maize. But we've heard compelling stories and, and really heartfelt information about the importance of soil, and the move to regen agriculture. Who's going to fund that? It takes four to five years to get through that transition. You know, most of the big names that you see have had a slug of money outside support. What role will the supply chain play in, you know, providing a fair price and driving change? Um, you know, there are 70 months now to 2030 where we need to see 30% of land managed for nature if we're going to seriously live sustainable lives and address the nature and climate emergencies. 70% um, of farms in Wales only derive a surplus from agricultural subsidies. There is a lot less money in the pot. So how will the supply chain have to fill that gap? At the moment, we've got the third sector, mobilizer, drawing down on global philanthropy to in some cases fill the gap that should come on the state or the supply chain. But I don't think that's okay, and I hope you don't either. And I think we all need to realise that we've all got a role to play in how we source food, how we buy food, and the changes we support and the pressure we can put on the supply chain. We've heard tonight that that pressure has been impactful. We need to keep it up until we get to the place where we've got the right things happening day in, day out, at scale. Great stuff. And look, we told you a little bit about heading to the AGMs to ask some tough questions. We'll be returning this uh, summer, uh, May, June, July's AGM season of the big corporates. We'd really like to see all retailers in the catchment uh, bring forward a specific plan how they'll support producers to transition to a friendly, to a friendly farming system uh, and indeed have a clear policy and document to do that. We're also really welcoming and uh, all kudos to Simon and team at the Wild House Foundation for work uh, on being funded by corporates, but we think there's more opportunity to spread that work, to get more resource from them, uh, and so we're looking forward to collaborating with the Wine House Foundation to do just that. But look, it's an election year, please hold your politicians to account, please hold your corporates to account, please do collaborate with your farmers to ensure they get a fair deal uh, for themselves, for the river, and indeed for nature. We look forward to collaborating with you, and likewise, come challenge us when you feel we need to be done so. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, James and Jamie. Our next speaker is Kathy Cliff from the Soil Association, who will be speaking about their upcoming campaign and their work. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. I'm Kathy. Um, I work in the policy unit at the Soil Association charity. Um, the Soil Association, for those who don't know, is a UK wide sustainable food and farming charity. We create practical nature-based solutions for, for food, farming and forestry, uh, and we lobby governments and industry on key environmental policies and practices. My role is to set up and run citizens' engagement campaigns based on our policy priorities. And um, sorry for this plug, but we're launching a new campaign next month that will tell the story of the impact of intensive chicken farming on the Y, and how if we don't take drastic action, we could see other rivers in the UK suffer the same fate. As you've already heard this evening, the River Wye is facing environmental collapse. In 2023, its status was downgraded by Natural England to unfavourable declining due to declines in key species that should be protected by its designation as a special area of conservation under the Habitats and Species Regulations. Phosphate pollution is a particular concern in the catchment, 
with excess phosphate in local soils, resulting from the spreading of livestock manure running off into the river, causing those algal blooms which remove oxygen from the water and block out sunlight, killing natural biodiversity. The intensification of livestock and arable farming in the Y catchment over the past 50 years has created unsafe concentrations of phosphate in soils and the river, but it's a rapidly growing poultry industry that has proven to be the final straw. The regulatory authorities in England and Wales have all identified poultry farming as a key source of phosphate pollution. Chickens are now the most numerous animals farmed in the catchment, with more than 20 million being farmed at any one time, a quarter of the UK's chickens. Broiler or meat chickens are produced in particularly high numbers in any one operation, especially when you take into account that the average broiler chicken lives up to only 40 days, and there can be around seven or so called crops a year in each unit, and many operations have multiple units. Huge volumes of manure generated by the chickens in these units are spread on local land and are a primary source of phosphate pollution in the river. This situation where one of our most important conservation sites has been so heavily impacted by the spreading of chicken manure, far in excess of what is needed to fertilise the area's crops, is partly the result of flaws in the planning system and in environmental regulation. Largely though, it's our food system that has supported the tragic decline of the river. This is a system held up by a consolidated supply chain with international food processing companies and supermarkets pulling the strings. Prices are kept low with the excuse that consumers want and expect cheap chicken, despite the fact that we pay less than half the price for a chicken today that we paid in 1971, and often for less than the price of a cup of coffee. Even if monitoring and enforcement step up and regulation becomes more stringent, there is currently no viable way to address the impact of the huge numbers of chickens we farm each year and the vast volumes of manure produced in intensive poultry units. What we really need is system change. We need to end the construction of intensive poultry units and reduce the number in existence. Remaining units should operate under a new permitting system applied at much lower population thresholds, which include requirements for animal welfare and waste management. We need a just, a just transition for farmers to move out of this damaging industry. Many farmers are locked into a long-term financial commitment to a poultry unit on their land, with loans having been taken out as part of a contract with a chicken processor. This transition must be carefully managed to protect, protect producer livelihoods and prioritise animal welfare. It will require change across supply chains, shifts in diet and a fair deal for farmers and consumers. We need fewer chickens in existing poultry units via implementation of the Better Chicken Commitment, a set of standards that retailers and food service operators can sign up to, committing them to sourcing chicken meat produced as a result of less intensive practices, including slower growing birds, less waste and reduced reliance on products like soya that are grown in sensitive environments overseas. We need to reduce overall production and consumption of meat, including chicken, with a shift towards more and better plants and industrial poultry phased out in schools and hospitals. We'd love your support for our campaign launching next month. We'd like to invite you to be the first to sign our petition, which was in the display area and reception earlier, and I hope we'll be back there later. But please have a look on our website, and thank you very much for listening. Um, Andrew Brody, who's their communications director, and Emily Don, who's their head of sustainability, will come up and present. And I'm also calling up Patrick Lewis from Gamba, because he'll be speaking after Avara, and then all three may answer some questions afterwards. So thank you. And yeah, that's the next slide, I believe. Yeah, go for it, and do stand in front of this microphone so everyone can hear you. No you problem. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to Friends of the Wife for uh, inviting us to. Uh, talk this evening about the Avara roadmap uh, in the River Y. Um, I think the first thing that's important to say about this is um, the challenge that we have is both supply and demand. There is in this catchment uh, a massive arable farming sector that has a demand for fertiliser. Our role in that as a poultry supplier 
has been to supply manure as one of the fertiliser solutions to that farming sector. It has been, but that has stopped in January this year. So from January 2024, we are no, no longer allowing our farmers to sell manure as a fertiliser to arable farming in the catchment. That's about 100,000 tonnes a year, just over. It's 2,000 tonnes a week. It's being transported, and you'll hear later how it's being transported, primarily to be recycled and used, uh, for example, to create CO2, biofuel uh, and power. The reason we've taken that step is because we've recognised that once we sell our manure into a wider farming sector, we have lost control on how it's used. And our current view is that the assurance enforcement is not there to give us the confidence to do that and ensure that the product is used consistently uh, and appropriately. As a supplier to that sector, we only have one thing we can really do, and that's not to supply it anymore. And that's what we're doing. However, a quarter of our manure is staying in catchment. And that's because we've got farmers who are both poultry and arable farmers who clearly want to use their own manure. We're insisting that they pilot a higher assurance standard and higher levels enforcement because we think that is the long-term answer, better soil management and better nutrient management in the catchment. But we're talking 30 farms in a catchment area with 3,500 arable farms. It's a drop in the ocean. So what we're hoping for is through working together with all parts of the farming community, we can actually use this as a catalyst to build wider spread change in how we manage soil and how we manage uh, crops and farming across the catchment. And hopefully what we've done in January and will be doing through this year has helped to do that. Emily's going to take you through that in more detail now. Oh, maybe not. Oh. Wrong direction. I apologise. I'm going to get into some of the detail, or as much detail as I can, in five minutes. So building on what Andrew said, we've looked heavily and closely at the Refocus project, understanding the map and the journey of pea throughout our supply chain. Starting at that inclusion end, where it comes into our diets, and understanding the life cycle of that pea whilst in our supply chain, but also understanding and mapping it as it leaves our supply chains and enters other businesses' supply chains within the catchment. So understanding that full cradle to grave with visibility and stewardship for that manure, not just in our own integration and supply chain, but also that downstream as well. For us, it's really important, as Andrew said, to look at that diversion away from land application. So removing that pea attributed to poultry litter from land application within the catchment. So where farmers historically could have been selling to third parties within catchment, and where farmers don't want to meet the new assurance standards which we'll go into on the next standards, on the next slide, we have diverted that litter volume away from land application and as a result that pea loading that would have historically been spread to land. Long term we'd like to find a solution that looks at localised in catchment solutions that maintains that diversion away from land application of pea but can add localised value from what is a valuable product and a finite resource. We're looking at traceability throughout the supply chain, not just for those farmers who maintain the litter within the catchment for use on the pilot, um, but also when it leaves the catchment as well. Understanding where that litter goes through our logistics provider, but also understanding the application, so that grade, the end point, does it go into AD, does it go into litter burning, does it go for land application out of catchment. However, as Andrew says, we can cut off the supply of, of uh, manure, manure, but that's not enough in isolation without addressing the demand, which remains very much intact at the moment. So looking at assuring the small proportion of our litter that remains in catchment for land application, making sure that we, you, all have confidence that that manure is spread appropriately. We have some really engaged, innovative farmers who are working closely with us on this pilot route through a third party to ensure that they have a legitimate crop need and their soil indices all aligned to demonstrate there is a need that that manure is a really valuable fertiliser. Working with this small group of 30 farmers, we can work closely with them to understand the challenges they're facing and how we can support them along the route. We need greater assurance and that assurance scheme through the third party can help demonstrate our farmers are acting sustainably. 
They have a direct crop need and can demonstrate through annual audits, through document checks, that that process is being followed. But ultimately, it's 30 farms out of over 3,500 operating within the catchment in fresh produce and arable. For us and where we really started focusing on data, the old adage that you can't manage what you don't measure really rings true, and we need to understand our impact and how we can manage that. As we said, we've mapped the flow of phosphorus throughout our supply chain, from the inclusion at the front end in our diets and tracking that year-on-year -year reduction over the last 10 years to where we are today. Understanding how the birds utilize that valuable nutritional product to help with bone and skeletal development and bird welfare, what happens when they excrete the phosphorus, any surplus, and ultimately the pea content contained within that manure that leaves our supply chains and enters other supply chains. We need to also make sure that we follow the trail of that manure out of our supply chain to that ultimate end destination as well. Over time, while we've been analysing our data and monitoring it, we have seen data refinement, moving from relatively crude assumptions, industry averages, industry coefficients, to where we are today, where it's better data, activity-based data, physical farm samples, physical manure and litter and faecal samples, to help give a more accurate picture of what is going on within our supply chain. Data quality is really critical and building a better picture over time has been really important <coughs> to help us understand our supply chain and the impact we're having. For example, through our data set and the research we've done in terms of the manure and faecal samples, we can see that the older birds in our supply chain, so our breeder lane birds, have a higher pea content within the manure than our broiler birds. So it's almost double. We have fewer breeder birds within our supply chain, but it's understanding and managing that litter that comes out of our different supply chains that's critical. But whenever we look at our data, we look at it in isolation. We don't see many other data sets sat within the catchment from any of the other parties involved. The distinct lack of real data has meant that there's a heavy reliance on averages, outdated industry averages, which don't fairly represent the industry. We need better data representative of all actors within the catchment to really drive change. So to finish, um, this plan is now in place. We are exporting 100,000 tonnes of manure out of about 140,000 or just over. We are piloting a higher assurance scheme but with a handful of farms in the greater catchment. We need that transition now, we need that momentum as a sector, as a, as a catchment area because if not then all we've done is disrupt, disrupt a fertiliser supply chain. We're already seeing, as we export manure out, adverts in Shropshire offering to bring it, bring not our manure, but bring other manure and fertiliser in. We don't want to create a circle here where we're exporting and it comes back in. And that's why we need to engage the wider stakeholder group. It's fantastic to see this group of stakeholders this evening, the proactive campaign groups. Uh, we've got the EA, we've got National Resources Wells, we've got the supply chain as well. What Martin showed earlier about that farmer understanding now that, we, that we're seeing and the farmer awareness of the issues is also great to see. But personally, for the next time, there are some big companies like us in the supply side, in the demand side, the big brands that those potato and arable farming sectors supply that also need to be talking to their farmers and coming up with their plans of how they're going to ensure that soil is managed effectively in the catchment. We all go shopping, we know they are, they need to be here with us. And that way, we'll restore the why. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have a few questions. So, a few times you said things like, well, you know, we're a drop in the ocean, which I understand about the manure, but just for context, as, as you were talking about stats and numbers, you know, you are 16 million of the 20 million of birds in the Y catchment. So you're 80% of the poultry sector, and the poultry sector is a leading issue. So we also know that there's more manure than the land can absorb. So as you say, it's a, it may be about educating farmers that they don't need all this manure, but we know they don't need all this manure. So it is right to reduce, reduce that load. I wondered, given that the Refocus report recommends reducing livestock numbers, do you see any pathway for your farms to reduce the stocking density of the units? So that if they can have a higher price for chicken, that's better welfare chicken, maybe through labelling to the consumer so consumers can see when a product is intensive indoor rather than higher welfare indoor or free range. 
Do you think that there's a, a route here for the consumers to know what they're buying and to reduce demand for that kind of intensive culture, which would mean your growers could get more of a price, a higher price, but produce fewer birds, and that'd be a route to reducing bird numbers? That's a... I think the challenge is in terms of the, the consumer population is affordability. All of those ranges are available. Uh, the issue has been that where the sales fall, and we, we do higher welfare programs, however the sales are minuscule compared to the, the, the standard program. Just to be clear on drop in the ocean, we're a drop in the ocean in arable farming. Because, and, and to be honest, my concern is, well, you're right, we're a, a big part of that manure production in the catchment, but fundamentally, uh, it's the market it supplies and actually changing that market so that it doesn't have a requirement for manure that is what we need to do. That's the area where we need engagement from areas who are actually experts in soil. We're, we're not a soil management business. That's not our area of expertise, but that's what we need to, to take that issue forward, I believe. Cool, thank you. Also, you talked about the importance of data, and you've got that, you know, your numbers are vastly different to the numbers, as you say, of the old DEFRA coefficients and averages that we use to calculate refocus. But who's validating your data? Is there any independent auditing of your data that will become transparent so that we understand how you've reached these calculations and how they're made? Um, not at the moment. We have, uh, over time, we have refined our data set, have had an inter interesting conversation over the break about how we might be able to do that. and how we can get that verification process. It is something we've talked about internally and also where does that data sit? Does it feed through to the Nutrient Management Board? Where's the appropriate avenue to get that viewed and to get that confidence in the data set? We, so we did go through the process with Lancaster that we yeah. went through, so they're aware of the process we went through. We went through it in, in terms of stages. It is based on real sampling, so it's not estimates. It's not using coefficients, it's based on farm sampling. Um, and we're, we're happy to actually get, get uh, a wide degree of transparency and auditing of that. Our concern is, you look at our numbers and then you look at the focus numbers, they're wildly different. And I don't think Lancaster would mind me saying what they said to us. They've been hugely frustrated at the lack of real data that they've been able to extract outside the numbers we've given them. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it would definitely make sense to get yours independently audited yep. and those tests done so we can see the real quantities and someone can independently come in and repeat some of what you've done to make sure that we can be confident in that methodology. Because yep. I know Lancaster have seen it, but they haven't repeated it, is my understanding. So they haven't been able to, they've said it looks like a reasonable process, but we haven't been able to check it, is my understanding. You know, they haven't gone and done the tests, check how much <laughs> no, no, manure on each they, farm. They, 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 were, yeah. they, they, they didn't want to get into that. No. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just but for clarity, so that. that's a really important part of the data picture, I think, that we validate that data, because there is a... Obviously, we're citizen, lots of citizen scientists here today. Our data is freely available. And having a richer data picture of where manure is spread, what soil indices are, if that data can be shared within the catchment, I think that would be a really positive commitment. Um, I wondered as well, you mentioned that the, you're doing the soil assurance with, I think it's Red Tractor is your assurance scheme, right, for the soil testing. Can you tell us any more about how that's going to work? And I think you said on one of your slides that it's addressing a loophole in the farming rules for water that they're going to try and kind of fill a gap with this soil testing. If there's a loophole in the farming rules for water, would you wish that that was addressed by government and regulation? So, so it's, we've worked quite extensively with bodies operating within the catchment who, to be honest, have got far better knowledge of land-based practices, soils, than we do. So understanding that in terms of many farms are applying based on end need and actually we need to make sure that it's P need that is considered as well. So making sure it really incorporates that as well. Um, but again, we've evolved the standards over time, starting with a farming rules for water and taking wider feedback as actually where does it need to be strengthened and where do we need to add some weight behind it to give everyone within the catchment the confidence that that is an assurance programme. It is a pilot and we are just piloting it with our group of 30 farmers at the moment. Um, but potentially there's um, application for wider rollout over time. I think the key thing we're able to do with our farmers, because they're in our supply chain, is I think it was Charles mentioned right at the start of the evening about it's like the police, you need some degree of check and enforcement. Effectively, we're requiring them to follow, follow that, and if they don't follow it, their manure will be exported. So there's a, there's a degree of rigour that we're able to apply to our own farms. The question is, what does that look like? <coughs> or a, a wider catchment as was raised at the top of the evening. Thank you so much. And just one point, I guess, to respond when you said there's not necessarily the consumer demand for the better meat. 
I think what's interesting is only the better meat is labelled as better meat. You know, the higher welfare standards, they proclaim their virtues. But in eggs, they introduced the labelling, mandatory method of production labelling, which meant it had to say eggs from caged hens. And when that came in in 2004, there was a huge consumer change. Like, the market totally changed. To, it went from caged hens, caged eggs were the majority of the market, to caged eggs became quite a small minority of the market in just a year. Because when consumers saw eggs from caged hens, they didn't want to buy it so much. So actually, if the low welfare meat was labelled intensive indoor in the same way, and that was mandatory, I, it may be a key part of changing consumer demand for that product, which then would reward the farmers. But I it want was, to... uh, if that was a level playing field that all imports had to follow, then we'd have a fighting chance. Yeah. Otherwise, you will have a, a two-tier country where those that can afford it get higher value chicken and those that can't get stuff brought in from outside uh, yeah. standards. I think, those should, I think all labelling should apply to imports. That's, that's that, not that, where we are. No, that's where we need to fight to get to. So would we have common ground there? Uh, well... With, with our current legislative framework, it's a common ground to, to put the UK industry out of business. But, but we would still be eating chicken, it just wouldn't come from here. Yeah, it's okay. Mm, okay. Right, we don't have an agreement on that yet. But um, thank you very much. And then if you stay here while Patrick presents for Gamba, because Patrick will explain where, where this manure is going. Well, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Lewis, born, bred, lived and worked within Herefordshire, within agriculture, all of my life. I'm also lucky enough to have lived alongside the River Wye all of my life, and therefore I'm as passionate as you all to make sure we do something about it. My reason for being here this evening is to explain what Gamba and our business is buying and selling poultry litter, what we're doing about the litter at the moment. As you've heard earlier, uh, on the 1st of January, uh, we entered into a agreement with Avara, and that agreement is that we will move all of the poultry litter out of the Y Valley catchment area, apart from their pilot farms. That tonnage, again, has been explained earlier, is 2,000 tonnes per week. We've been doing it for 54 days, and I know that because I count every day because it's such a challenge at the moment with the wet weather. So, where is it going? Uh, we are taking it to three, three different types of location at the moment. We're taking it to Thetford Power Station, 200 miles away. But they have a shortage of feedstock at the moment, so thankfully they're able to take it. It's going to a lot of anaerobic digesters throughout the country. We're taking it as far as Gateshead, 260 miles away. We're taking it down to Kent, 200 miles away. And lastly, we're taking it to land outside the Wye Valley, Valley catchment area. And that would be areas such as Staffordshire, where the Lancashire University have shown that there is a need for phosphate. There are needs for phosphate in different areas of the country, and there are needs for area, uh, phosphate in Herefordshire itself. But at the moment, we're taking it out of the catchment area. However, it is not sustainable what we're doing. And before I signed the contract with Avara, I told them it is not sustainable. But, in fairness to them, they said, we need to draw a line in the sand and show that we're serious about it. And that's what happened on the 1st of January. So, what are we doing about it going forward? Long term, we're building a portal. And that portal, I say long term, I'm hoping that it will be done in the next five weeks. But that portal will have five different things on it. The first, and it's been discussed already, cradle to grave. Where is it coming from? And to show the uh, detail we're going to, the lorry driver will take a picture of his way cell on the lorry, and that will be sent by WhatsApp, and on that WhatsApp it will be able to show the exact location and time it was taken and the lorry registration. So that's where it's starting. And then, if it's going to land, it will have to have a nutrient management plan. It will have to have a, an agronomist recommendation. And that agronomist will have to tell us how much litter that farmer can buy on that particular year. So if it's 300 tonnes, that's all we will sell him. We've entered into agreement with Avara, and we're going to stick to it. And lastly, uh, the cherry on the cake will be when it's being spread on land, 
uh, GPS tracking of that being spread, so the date it's being done, the amount it's being done. With technology nowadays on these machines, they can show the exact weight that's being spread on the land. So that's what we're working towards, and hopefully we'll have that by around about the 1st of April, and that is not an April Fool. However, and the reason for doing this, as been described earlier, is full traceability to give everyone confidence we're doing what we say we will do with it. So, long term. I've been asked what we're doing long term about it. It's been discussed already. Now, in my view, we cannot bring... Uh, chemical, sorry, fertiliser in from the likes of Morocco and so on when we've got it on our doorstep. However, we've got to use it responsibly. And there are a huge amount of different uh, projects in the pipeline. They need planning, which I know is not difficult, easy to do. So they're uh, creating biogas. Now the government have said that they are looking to increase the 732 existing uh, digesters, anaerobic digesters and so on, to 2000 by 20, 2030. There's massive amounts of money out there from businesses that want to invest into biogas and, and into renewables. In Herefordshire alone, we have Hereford Biogas that's looking to increase its use uh, by around about 20,000 tonnes of litter. Uh, its point of difference is it's looking to strip out the phosphate, strip out the nitrogen, and that be removed out of the catchment area. We've heard of ONU, it's been in the papers. They're looking to bring pyrolysis into Herefordshire. So those two businesses alone would take around about 66,000 tonnes of the 100,000 tonnes we've got to move. And that's, that could happen in as short a time as two years' time. So, uh, it is not sustainable to do what we're currently doing, but it has to be done. As earlier said, sadly, there is poultry litter coming back into the Wye Valley catchment area, not through us, but it's happening because farmers know it's a good source of fertiliser and fibre for their land. So, again, we've got, all got to work together. So, I'm hoping that uh, you can see we're doing something about it. We are, in fairness, talking to Noble in order to try and help them with their roadmap. Um, so, that's what we're doing at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate knowing the travel distances. As you say, it's not sustainable to be tracking heavy chicken manure hundreds of miles. Um, it's only a short-term sticking plaster on what needs to clearly be system change. But thank you. I think we should proceed on to Noble Foods. I also want to thank the bar for being here because we did invite other poultry companies to attend, including Stonegate and Two Sisters. Um, and we're going to have Noble Foods next. So to credit to Avara and Noble Foods for coming and sharing this data information and taking some questions. Um, yeah, so now we're being joined by Noble Foods. We've got Liam Burke, the managing director of Noble, and Glenn Evans, who is the head of sustainability at Noble Foods. My name is Liam. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Noble here this evening. Um, just a little. Sorry. Oh. Sorry. Oh no. I don't know what's happened there. I'll let the I'll let the tech man Jimmy find your slides. <laughs> so a little bit first of all about Noble. So we are a family-owned um, owned business involved in the agri-food sector, and our interests lie in egg and animal feed milling. Uh, this slide here in front of us, just to give you a, a share with you in terms of our presence in the catchment. We have 31, we source egg from 31 family farms, average flock size about seven, just over 17,500. And uh, our total flock size is just under 550,000. That's quite reduced quite dramatically over the last few years. And taking your figures that you published, uh, Nicola, we reckon we're about 2.5% of the total poultry flock in the area. So, our journey so far, we accepted some time ago that we were, we were part of the problem and therefore could be part of the solution. We've built strong relationships with the organisations uh, there on the slide um, and we've provided funding to RAP 
uh, to facilitate projects in the area and expertise using uh, the Wireless Foundation to help uh, provide advice and also deliver uh, on-farm improvements as well. We've worked with all naval foods producers like, like Joe there um, and we've made good break progress in delivering um, on-farm Im improvements. Nature-based solutions in the form of constructed wetlands for flood mitigation have proved really successful. Um, and on one particular farm, we've, we've ended up um, reducing phos phosphate by about 50%. Um, positive uh, impacts of no, um, nature-based solutions can never be underestimated. And for me in particular, I'm, I'm very passionate about their use. So in terms of projects completed so far, um, we've completed a wide range of projects. We, we realised during this process that not one size fits all and any recommendations put forward to um, or individual to, to that particular farm. And there's, there's various factors that can influence that, such as topography, uh, size and location. Um, some of the nature-based solutions that we've put in place, like buffer strips, range, range reseeding, improvements in range management, um, increasing, increasing uh, tree cover to a minimum of 20%, which goes above and beyond uh, what is required. And wetlands, of course, have been implemented. We've improved um, diversion and storage capacity of dirty water. Um, we've done some concrete, uh, concreting of uh, manure handling areas as well, which reduce hot spots of nutrients, stop runoff, um, and make, make those areas a lot easier to clean as well. And then the last part there is to separate uh, clean roof and um, surface water from, the, from other areas of the farm. So during our time and our collaboration with other parties, uh, we've, we've done, um, we identified five key pillars which we feel um, make up our roadmap and will be um, really fundamental in making progress going forward. So in terms of compliance, we'll continue to share knowledge with regulators and align with, with those regulators as well, and continue partnerships with uh, the organisations that we've been working close with, such as the Wireless Foundation, NFU, um, Herefordshire Rural Hub and RAP, um, and then ho ho um, help to deliver uh, best practice guidance for our producers. In terms of investment and improvement, we're represented in supporting uh, our producers at an industry level uh, to improve access to capital support and grant funding opportunities. Um, as an example, uh, manure storage grant opportunities are lacking in the poultry industry and we feel this really needs to be changed to, to, to make a fundamental change into how we store and manu move manure within, within the catchment. In terms of nutrient management, we will uh, do due diligence by, by, by ourselves and ensure every farm, where required, has a robust nutrient management plan in place. Supporting advisors, uh, supporting um, and giving advice to, to our farmers on whole farm nutrient management planning. And the other element here as well is we're going to do a pilot study on whole, whole farm phosphate budgeting as well. The selection of our producers who have arable land and any lessons learned from that project as well will be, will be shared with other producers in the catchment as well. <coughs> in terms of manure management, um, we'll continually improve manure management in line with the nutrient management plans. Um, we're also working hard with partners such as Gambas in how we facilitate the export of manure from the area. But we also need to ensure that manure storage facilities allow for export and that goes back to the previous point about capital funding for, for those. Um, we'll also conduct mapping of manure, um, inputs and outputs and movements from the area to give us a phosphate baseline that we can then demonstrate to, to other parties um, how we reduce that phosphate load from our operations going forward. And then in terms of um, knowledge and sharing and collaboration, we've heard a lot about the importance of working together. We're going to continue working with third parties to find alternative uses of manure and in, in, in investigate in innovative solutions for reducing phosphate. And thanks, Ben. We um, the three pillars that we've indicated we believe are fundamental to the success of our journey, and we are working 
uh, at this, this moment in time, in time in creating an environmental incentive scheme that we hope to have finalised in the next month or so, where we can then share with our producers. But we will incentivise our producers to follow this nutrient out of this uh, environmental scheme. So in summary, I want to reiterate our unwavering commitment to, to, to driving positive change in this area. We are dedicated to, to making sure we, we, we are de dedicated to playing our part and we recognise that addressing these challenges requires our, requires our, our, our collective work. New, nutrient management is a paramount, paramount to the success as is grant funding and policy adaptation inclu and including inter external investment in technology. We are here tonight to emphasise the importance of our collaboration and together with the participation and partnerships that we have developed, we believe we can positively inst in instigate change in this sector. Thank you. Thanks so much. Very quick questions off yes. the back of that, and then we'll move on. One is that you mentioned that you're 2.5% of the total poultry industry, but in the catchment. Do you know what proportion of the egg industry you are? We, it's an estimate. I think uh, I think the, about our colleagues in Navarra mentioned about data as well. We have the same challenges, so we we reckon in the, and it's a guesstimate. We're somewhere between two and two and a half million birds of, of laying hens in the catchment area. Okay. But that's a guesstimate on our part. So what you're so like a uh, fifth 20, of it. 20 odd percent we would say. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. That's just useful but to know the context. Because you're one currently. and you're one part of the egg market. So I should say that, you know, we invited other members of the egg industry to come tonight and they all declined. But I wanted to particularly share with the audience the British Egg Industry Council, which is like the body that's meant to represent all the eggs. Um, we invited them here and they said, yeah, we'll come to support one of our members, which I assume is you. And then when I said we'd ask some questions, they said, on reflection, we feel that more is to be gained on this important topic if we continue to focus on working with and actively engaging with all stakeholders through various established stakeholder meetings, rather than in this format, we will therefore not send a representative. Is that because they've got nothing to say? Look, I, 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 we're obviously members of the British Egg Council, but I'm not here representing this evening. Clearly, we would. But are we any would, other we, eggs doing anything? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, 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 well, if you, uh, uh, I suppose if you talk, um, their, their commitment to sign up to the water roadmap, there are no other egg suppliers doing that. But we're, we're not here to talk about other egg suppliers. We're, we're here to focus on what we're doing mm -hmm. and, and, and focus on that. We, we recognise collaboration with others, and we, 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 we clearly would welcome others to join us. Um, Do you yeah. ever have a problem though with if you're asking your producers to meet a higher standard that they can just leave can, you yes. and go elsewhere? Yes, we, that is we, a we can we that find that quite problem. lonely at times. Yeah, but look, yeah. we we work. We will. We are actively encouraging others, and uh, I suppose one of the outputs of this of this forum is to is hopefully to get others to come on board, uh, replicating what Avara said earlier on. Clearly, it, it's a it's a collective responsibility. Well, one of the ideas that came out early, wasn't it, was from Nick Misham was talking about reducing that permit threshold. So if all you know at the moment, few egg units are actually above the forty thousand birds. Yep. If instead all egg units had to have environmental permits. Would you be in favour of that, so that they well, all get inspected? Yeah, just to give you some level of comfort, we're operating, without the regulatory control, we're operating those standards in our units. We have a, we put those voluntary standards in our units, so we're operating that. But clearly, if it's a regulatory response, then we're open to that. Right. So, yeah, because at the moment, there's no level playing field here, right? No. Because if unless there's a strong regulatory flaw, yeah. then there's kind of, you know, some yeah. people are going to spend money on it, some people aren't. Okay, just one final question, which is that... Uh, I know that there was a story in The Observer a few weeks ago about the fact that there was a report on free-range egg units that showed, I think, 19 of 47 sites that were inspected had drains going straight from the poultry unit into a watercourse. Are they the kind of problems that you're finding? And is there, is there some of just no solution? Well, we, as we shared with yeah. you in the, in the slide deck, some of the solutions that we have encountered have, have, have been addressing issues like that, so nature-based solutions. And again, when you think of a nature-based solution, you think it's, you don't need planning permission, you do. And that's, that's another issue that needs to be overcome, so make it easier for, for producers to embrace a te a te a technology such as that. At the moment as well, there isn't a policy for wetland use on a farm, so we would really want that to come along because we, we see I'm passionate about nature-based solutions in any case but we really want to see we, we see the benefits of 
the trial that we're doing on one of our farms. So we feel uh, that, that that would be a real benefit to us. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>
um, funding is misaligned. We're cross-border, so we've got rules on both sides of the border that don't always talk to each other. And we've got a degenerative system, and we've got market pressures. Well, the market pressures can be solved, but they can't really be solved until we get the regulatory floor. The regulatory floor then increases price evenly. Then the supermarkets can charge more. Because, and at the moment, the people here are the producers. They're the people who are acting as the intermediaries. They're not the retailers. The retailers determine the price. So if we continue to pressurise the producers, then we've got to, it's got to give one way or the other if we're going to actually make this sustainable. And for each, I'm going to finish, wrap up now, but for each one of these issues, for flows, water temperature, eutrophication, acidity, etc., we need to understand what is the quantum of it, how much of, it, how much of an impact is it having, where is it coming from, what is the cause, how do we solve it, do we directly address the cause, do we mitigate it, who does it, how is it funded, and then when it's done, how effective was the action that was taken to do it, and then go around the process again. And this way we can take an actual logical approach to improving the river. One of the joys uh, recently, and there are, haven't been very many, was reading an NRW report that showed that there were no acid water problems present in the Upper Y. I was like, yes, because we're measuring the pH of some of the streams that are draining the high forest, and it's coming out at 3 or 3.5, pH 3.5. But because of the liming program that's in place, we've got no acid water problems in the catchment. And it's just like, but if we stop that liming program, we would have 62 kilometers poisoned by acidity. So there are things happening and you don't always see them. But I would just like to leave it at that point because I could go on to the solutions and what the solutions are, but that's an hour. Okay, thank you, Simon. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, Emma Johnson from Natural England. Go for it. Mm. Oh, you don't have slides. I do. Do you? Yeah, I have three. There they are. Hey! Sorry. Who thought an evening, a Friday evening, talking about manure could be so <laughs> inspiring? But truly it is. Partly because of the volume of people here who care as much as I do and as much as Natural England does, and all the speakers that we've had. So good to hear so much common sense and so much common ground. Um, so I was just going to talk a little bit about Natural England's role. And I'm often asked, what are you doing about it, Natural England? And yeah, do I have an answer there? Uh, the size of the text on this slide indicate the weight that each of those levers have. Um, and I'll talk about, a bit about that in a few minutes. So we talked about the site of special scientific interest. And this is shown on the slide here. So the River Wye and part of the River Lug, the River Wye in England and, and part of the River Lug form the SSSI, which form the special area of conservation, which tells us what we all instinctively know, this is a really, really special area. So last year, I had the sober experience, well actually the Secretary of State did it for me, she announced the downgrading of the SSSI from unfavourable recovering to unfavourable declining, and we've heard people mention about this already. And the change was based on looking at four indicator species, aquatic plants, salmon, white clawed, clawed crayfish and water quality. But that deterioration in the river quality doesn't reflect a sudden decline in the health of the river. It is the result of centuries of changes in agricultural practice, in industry, climate change, urbanisation, and the fact that there are more of us. So we're now dealing with what you will have heard people say, but it's legacy phosphate. It's phosphate that is stored in the soil, which has come from centuries, not just 50 years, of increasingly high input, high output farming. And that has been responding to the demand for cheaper food after the war, the demand for more food, and therefore the, the steers from various governments. Now the Refocus report is a brilliant source of data and there are flaws in it we know. Um, can we move on to my next slide, really? Uh, not yet. Um, but I just wanted to reiterate that the sources of phosphorus that are in the catchment at the moment, not just in England but in Wales as well, 75% of phosphate, 75 of phosphate comes from farming. Of that, as it's been said, 42% is from poultry, 
27 from cattle and 28 from sheep. So what are we doing about it? So our biggest tool is advice. In, from 2023 till now, uh, 200, about just over 200 holdings in the catchment have received a visit from one of my team. 85% of those farmers are implementing grass buffer strips along the river. That might not sound very much, but it is one of the key things that Refocus came up with and that we have come up with, which will stop phosphate from getting into the water. Natural England staff have made over a thousand advice recommendations to farmers, and over half of those you'll be really pleased to know are about soil health, manure, and fertiliser use. So we're going to be carrying on with that campaign this year, doing targeted visits along the Lug and Y SSSIs, with the aim of providing advice on everything and anything from bankside management to soils, land use, and of course funding streams. So. We also, um, what I should actually say is that hand in hand in, in, with our advice is our ability to incentivise advising on grants such as mid-tier and landscape recovery. But our advice is limited to people actually taking it up. We can't insist that they do it. We have no requirement that people act on our advice or take up on the grants. We advise the local planning authorities and one or two of them are represented here this evening. And in 2009, I wrote to the Heritage Council and Shropshire Council to say that any development in the Lug SSSI should not add to nutrient levels. I had to be nutrient neutral. We advise government. This is mainly DEFRA, but we advise on what the causes of the problems are and also what the solutions are. It may not always be very palatable to government, but as their advisor, we give them that independent and impartial advice. We facilitate. And that is very much about working with people in this room, with the bodies that you represent, working in partnership. We're supporting Heritage Council in, in the development of what they're calling a local nature recovery strategy. Hopefully you've heard with it, hopefully you're engaging with it where you can. It's a spatial planning framework that could set the Y catchment as a priority for the county, which would be absolutely awesome and I hope that happens. We've heard the Y catchment partnership talked about, we're a part of that. The Nutrient Management Board. I think, Jamie, thank you very much for recognising that is now re-energised. There's something called a statutory officers group, which sounds really dry, but what we have done is set up a task and finish group that's looking at what we can do, what things can we do on farms to reduce this legacy phosphate. And there's some gentlemen here tonight who are part of that group. Um, monitoring, so very much this is one river body, so we're joining up with the Environment Agency to make sure we collaborate on our monitoring plan. And we're starting the full condition assessment of the SSI because we did a light touch one last year. It's a big job, it's a lot of water and it will take a few years to complete. And I think Nicola introduced me as a regulator or not? I don't know if it is, but I know you're an environmental agency, you do regulate we something. Are. So regulate, it's a very, very tiny tool or lever that I have to use. And it is limited in terms of SSSIs to what goes in with, on within the SSI boundary. So if something's happening at the top of the catchment that is not in the boundary and it's not legal, there's not much that Natural England can do about it other than through advice and incentive. So just reflecting on the progress that has been made in the last few years, I don't think we would have had this honest, robust conversation with a range of partners we have here this evening two years ago. I think you reflected on that, Nicola. Um, I've been able to put uh, more than, well, 50% of the farm advisors that I have in the catchment. That's about four. It might not sound a lot, but it's about changing that culture of thinking about the way people manage the land. We have better evidence, but we need better evidence, and we need to get better at sharing it. You know, we have huge problems as a government organisation in sharing data. Hopefully, we're getting over that. But most of all, I think there is a coming together here. There's a consensus about the problem, and Martin, you stole what I was going to say, damn you. But, you know, we are, we're getting to a place of better collaboration. I've heard that collaboration, I think, from nearly every single speaker this evening. The recognition that we need significant land use change, but that is not an easy or quick thing to do, as I think everybody here recognises. We all want the Y to flourish, the catchment to be in a healthy condition so the rivers flourish. And that key to that is working together locally. It's understanding what we can all bring individually. As Martin said, and I was going to say as well, leaving our organisational views outside the door and just working together for the good of the river.
Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Great. To the Environment Agency, we're joined by Chair of the Environment Agency, Alan Lovell, and I don't know if any of his other team are coming up, but Alan is certainly presenting. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Nicola, thank you. Thanks. It's a great pleasure to be here. I think I have some understanding of how Daniel felt for when he uh, was. Uh, entrusted to the lions then. Uh, he was rather successful in dealing with the lions. I, I don't uh, expect quite as much success. I know that this will be uh, some challenge and I welcome that. I share your passion. I, uh, I don't live here but I do live between the test and the itching. I care about rivers. I also care about soil. I was at the NFU conference this week and I spoke to them about soil. It's so important to what so much of what we do. Infiltration helps flood, which is one of our responsibilities. It helps water resources because of the avoidance of irrigation, and of course it massively helps uh, water quality. I am not going to pretend that we were doing enough on the Y, or indeed elsewhere, in the way of inspections in the period up to 2022. I do think that there has been a very significant change over the last two years as we, in, in respect of our, uh, our approach to agriculture. And I was able to announce on Tuesday something equally significant in relation to the water industry. Now, I know, of course, uniquely here, um, we are talking more farmers than water industry, but nevertheless, you do have some water industry involvement, so it's perhaps interesting to say that uh, uh, we have secured very significant funding for a big increase of our inspections in our inspections of water companies. Uh, we will, are standing from now, it will take a bit of time for recruitment and training, but we're looking to go up from somewhere around 800, which has been clearly not enough, to 4,000 next year and 11,000 the year after. So I am actually, I'll just talk very briefly about the water industry because uh, um, we haven't covered that tonight and it is of some relevance here. I'm going to stick my neck out here. I am actually, I have some confidence uh, on the water industry for three reasons. One, the companies themselves are of course under massive pressure from polit politicians and from the public. Two, they are increasing their investment in the five year period from 2025 by about three times for what it is in the current five year period and that will make a small dent in what has been, in my opinion, under investment in the sector for 125 years since Victorian times. And third, with our big increase in regulation, I think you will see an improvement in water company performance, although it will take some time. Hello? Thank you for that helpful comment. I, I, I think I suggested something similar. Um, I, I think that uh, we can do, we, we, we will do work, good work there, but the, much the same, of course, is, is required on, on, uh, on agriculture farm inspections, and I think we have done a lot on that. So let me just cover one or two things. First of all, we did carry out, out over 500, and I'll, I'm going to split this down in a minute, but that's the headline number uh, it, already in the current year, up to the end of January 2024. Um, we are doing a load of monitoring, much of it in conjunction with Natural England, uh, as was just said, and we are investing serious time and resources to make a difference here. And where have we come from? Not enough. There's no doubt about that. We uh, were understaffed on our uh, inspections uh, up to the end of 2021. There was recruitment at that point, and we now have a decent team up and running. And I'll come on to some of the, the statistics that were, were covered earlier, but we have 12 officers, and this is quite similar uh, to, to Natural England. Again, West, West Midlands is a big patch but 50% of them are on the Y. So way above a proportionate uh, share 
and that is because we care about this and we are absolutely determined to make a difference. And what's that done to the number of inspections? In the year in which the recruitment happened, there were 99. In 22-23, which isn't on here, there were 227. And in the current year, up to the end of January, there were, were already 213, so we will be getting above that, above last year's number. And they recorded, as you might expect, at least a, a, a significant amount of non-compliance. And we have issued uh, uh, already 315 improvement actions. To their credit, the farmers are acting relatively quickly uh, to complete them, and we will, of course, be following that up and enforcing against any farmers who do not complete the agreed actions. The most common non-compliance is basic stuff in relation to soil testing and the preparation of nutrient management plans, which we should be looking for. In addition to that, we, we have supplemented the in-person inspections with some more high-tech stuff, uh, satellite tracking and drones. And so last year, 37, this year up to the end of, of January, 294. So again, a significant increase in the amount of effort and expenditure that we are putting into this. And there were, it is true, one or two teething problems uh, with the satellite uh, work early on. We've taken on feedback from the NFU uh, and uh, we'll, we, it will give us a great insight and will help us to determine those farms which we should visit quickly. As you know, some of them are permitted and this, has, as has been mentioned, is those with over 40,000 birds. And let me say straight away, it is a high priority for us to um, influence DEFRA to reduce that markedly. And I think that is a, a one area that, uh, on which we can definitely make it, uh, some improvement and which I think will have a, a big difference. Uh, there was talk earlier that it, it's, uh, the 4,000 is one in 25, 4,000 inspections is one in 25. That's true, but it's also misleading because we are highly focused on the areas that need it. And here, as you see, with the help of the equally solid uh, uh, inspection by the Pig and Poultry Assurance Scheme, we actually inspected 66 of the 76 permitted, so a much, much higher proportion. And I'm glad to say that the compliance with those permits is actually rather good, better than one might have expected. Uh, of the, of the uh, 66, we have um, uh, 60 results in so far, and 59 of them were in categories A and B out of the six bands. So, so this is at a, perhaps at a slightly better standard than one might have expected. We are anxious everywhere we are working to do things better. Uh, and these are all projects supported by TARA, Trialling Approaches to Regulation of Agriculture. So auditing AD plants, uh, assessing the use and export of poultry litter from much smaller farms, using digital technology, and as I've, as I've mentioned already, satellite images, drone footage, and LIDAR, wherever it is helpful to use it. I've been delighted with the sense of partnership this evening. I think it is really encouraging to see the number of bodies who are committed to making some improvement here. Um, and uh, we are certainly very much part of that, uh, and we shall continue to be. But I think it's, uh, it's a vital part of the, of the work, and we can't do it on our own. We can do it with you all, and we are delighted to be doing that. And uh, one of those partnerships is the through the Water Environment uh, Improvement Funding. We've invested 156,000 in that this year, uh, and some of these projects you will be familiar with, including production of some of the documentation that you saw earlier, like uh, farming in the Y. So, to to conclude. Um, Information is available. 
We recognise the need for transparency. Uh, I have a deal for you here. Uh, we will be uh, transparent with all data, uh, with, with all speed. I ask you, in return, to hold back, unless you have real need, on freedom of information requests in return. And the reason is that the people who answer those requests are the ones who should be doing useful work. I really ask you to take that seriously because uh, I think we can, we can work, if we work, are working together and we are transparent, you won't need to do that and I ask you not to. But, the, but the, you know, of course, if there is something serious, we expect it. But, but let's keep it under control because it does take an awful lot of time. We have tens of thousands and it's not as productive as some of the other work that we do. So I'm going to leave it there. Very, obviously, very happy to take questions, Nicola. But uh, I hope that gives you, I hope it gives you some impression of intent here. We do really care about this. We are on the case. Uh, we are working closely with Defra on it. The position is very different from how it was a little while ago. Equally, as has been said, and as you all know, there are some in embedded problems which will flow through for many years. We are not going to see immediate improvement. But I do think that there is an awful lot of good stuff going on which over time will see some improvement. Thank you. which was one was that on there we saw that you know you talked a lot about inspections that were happening and improvement actions that have been issued it said 79 were confirmed as completed out of 315 but what about the rest what will be the consequences you said there will be enforcement action but there was no there was uh -huh. no numbers for any enforcement action no, and this. there is and there is very little so far we do have a policy particularly with agriculture for advice and encouragement first that's true uh, but equally, we, are, we will be following up on all those actions and where there is um, failure to comply, we will certainly be taking enforcement action. Because the question is, why are you still in purely, mainly, advice and guidance mode when your, you, your, kind of, your unique selling point is that you can do enforcement? Everyone else can do advice and guidance. We've heard from Why Not Foundation, we've heard from Farm Herefordshire, we've heard from the charity. <laughs> can take enforcement action. So we, we'd actually rather you didn't necessarily do so much advice and guidance. Why don't you leave that to everyone else? And why don't you because, nick people? Because, as you know, we, don't, we can't get to the position of doing the enforcement unless we are going out there and seeing what is wrong. And I don't think, it, you know, as you well know, it's not a terribly easy time to be a farmer. There are some tough financial and other pressures on them as well. And I think that a balance between advice and engagement with them. In many cases there is lack of awareness of what they should be doing. In many cases there are financial issues. It, it's really important that we are taking a balanced view to deliver best results. I think it's really important that you enforce the law. And that's what we're doing. <laughs> and that, and that, will, that, is, that is what will happen where there is uh, failure to comply. It, it will happen short. It will happen very shortly. As we have, we have been on the case with the inspector. I'll keep, I'll keep going. I'll fight this corner. I'll fight this corner. I get the fact that, you know, you. When will it happen? Because it's a good question. Because the point is that right now, last year the river was, you know, downgraded to declining. The next stage down is destroyed. That's the next official category. So how bad does it have to get before you do start enforcing the law in a category? There's no question that uh, these, as you know, that the, these inspections started seriously in, in uh, 2022. We have to give folk uh, the opportunity to comply. There will be enforcement. Okay, well, I think you hear the audience desperation for enforcement. You heard the NGO's uh, desperation for enforcement. So I hope that you carry that message back to DEFRA very loudly. On that note, do we need a water protection zone? Do you need more powers to actually we, enforce? Uh, well, first of all, our, our um, powers have been increased this year already, and we will, we will use them where appropriate by virtue of the, uh, our ability to um, levy penalties instead of, just, uh, instead of taking everything through the court, which is a lengthy process. So we can do that. Also very helpful was the establishment last year of the Water Restoration Fund, which will see fines both from water companies and from farmers where appropriate going into a fund 
we are not the prime uh, users of that, mainly because we are the people who have put it there in the first place and there needs to be some governance over it. But we will be able to use that money and I'm quite sure that uh, the Y will be on the list, uh, high on the list of uh, those that benefit from it. I spoke to a former Environment Agency officer earlier today and he said that the Environment Agency first asked for a water protection zone for the Y in 2014. I, so that was 10 years ago. I doubt that that's the right thing to do at the moment. I think that there is a lot of good stuff going on by all the folk you have heard from, including us. I think that we should see how that pans out over the next 18 months. I don't think that implying a water protection zone would be particularly helpful at the moment, but if there is no significant improvement, then I can imagine that that would come back on the, on the, on the I list. Mean, you'd think, having been on the list for 10 years, it might now be the time. It's, but do Just because it was asked doesn't mean it's been on the list for well, 10 Herbiger years. Well, Heritage Council asked for it two years ago, quite desperately, in a very heartfelt letter to the oh, government, saying sorry. that they really felt the time was now. Here, here. Um, because this river is... I understand that. I understand that. Based on other questions that came in earlier, do you think, for example, that all livestock units should require an environmental permit? No, not necessarily, though it is something we are certainly looking at, and whatever the colour of the next government, it is something we shall be talking to them about. Right. Um, finally, one of the things that friends of the River Y do is we have lots of citizen scientists that report pollution incidents, as you know. It would be nice to be thanked as and, well. And, and we, do, yeah, we do lots of evidence collecting and data collection, and it is very valuable. And, and to be fair, the Environment Agency do use our data and look at our data, but I wanted to share with everyone and with you the fact that yesterday we reported a pollution incident on a Herefordshire Wildlife Trust nature reserve, which has had extremely high readings for a long time. What was interesting, and last year there was a grotesque pollution incident, the river was, you know, had over a kilometre of sewage fungus in it, it was really appalling. Right now, of over 180 sites tested by Friends of the River Wye, it's the worst site. We reported this pollution incident and we received an EA reply which said, if you know the source of the pollution, you may want to inform those responsible. They can take action to stop it. We thought, is it really up to citizen scientists to investigate the source of pollution and inform farmers? But also, it said this year the EA received less funding for environmental incidents. This means we are unable to respond to every environmental incident reported to us. So, is well, there an ask you want to make? How much more funding do you no, need so to be able to So, a few things. A few things. First yeah. of all, it's, I don't know when that was. It's simply wrong yesterday. to say we have got less funding. That was an email sent yesterday from the environment. I mean, that's simply wrong because our funding has increased. As I've explained. Put funding for environmental incidents. Well, less funding for environmental no, incidents. I, I don't think that's right. I think that, as I've said, I, I think we, we are, are appropriately funded. Sorry, the other thing you mentioned. Um, well, it said if we know the source no. of the pollution, maybe we should go and tell people responsible. So, actually, let me pick up one thing. If, if citizen scientists aren't feeling thanked, then I'm really, really sorry about that. And I will make sure that happens. We greatly value your work. It is indispensable. There are, I mean, let's be fair, there is one issue with it, which is that, and it goes against enforcement. It, for, for enforcement, we do need our own data. Well, yeah. But, but, no, and that's just a fact through the courts, so there's no way of avoiding that. But, but nevertheless, having the data from citizen scientists is very good education for us for where we should be looking. Exactly. When and we, we report, really, really appreciate it. So please keep going. And I am very sorry if you are not thanked for that because that's wrong. And, and actually our whole volunteering effort, we are having a good look at at the board because we think there is, A, we need to be looking after our existing volunteers better, but I think there's a big opportunity to use more. So it's a, it's a, it's a proper, think, very good point, which I t completely take. Thank you. I think that's the point, is that we have got all these citizen scientists doing this work. When we report a really egregious pollution incident and we get that kind of response, it feels extremely disappointing. That's an odd response, I grant, but equally we receive over 100,000 notifications of pollution incidents a year. And we do, have to have, we do have to triage them in some way. And yes, we will make some mistakes on them, there's no doubt, so I'm sorry if you've just had one. But you know, you can imagine I think you might have a little bit of sympathy on this. If you do get 100,000 uh, a year, it is, it is really difficult to know how to, how to handle them in an appropriate way. Over the last years, thank it? you for that helpful comment, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you very much. I think we'll have to draw a close to that and have Natural Resources Wales because the time is getting on. Thank you very much. Thank you.
we're joined by Sir David Henshaw, who is the Chair of Natural Resources Wales, and also by John Rock and by Anne Weedy. So I'm sorry it's got late tonight, everybody. Things were slightly derailed, but we, let's listen respectfully to Sir David Henshaw, who's travelled for hours to get here from North Wales. I'm very grateful to him. So let's hear from OK, him. so thank you very much. I'm losing my voice, so my colleagues will take over the detail. Two things from me. One is, it has been inspirational tonight to hear and see the passion around this, and I share that. And there's no doubt this is a massive challenge to us all. NRW covers the Environment Agency, Natural England, Forestry Division, all those responsibilities in one place. And of course, that means natural nature solutions, it means regulation, all sorts of fronts. And there's no doubt we could do more on regulation, but that wonderful presentation from the Soil Association gave the strength that how complicated this is, how interconnected it is, and what we need to do. And the one thing I would say, which is, um, is an admission, really. The public sector is not, I come from a public sector background, I mean, the public sector is not great at embra embracing volunteering. And actually, one of the things we have to do, and we're trying to do more and more, is get others to help us do some of the lifting. So some of the citizen science stuff, for example, is a classic example, but beyond just citizen science, the volunteering around this whole effort around water, water quality. We're, st we're just starting a big pilot to demonstrate a project in the west of Wales, on the Tybee, to try and bring together a wholly different approach to this. Not try the same things again, keep beating our head against the same wall, but try some different approaches involving us all in one aligned coalition, looking forward rather than shouting at who's to blame. And I'm very hopeful we can get a lot of more money out of that and resource and ideas. And one final thing, I'm absolutely clear, the legislative framework is not good enough. There's no question, these, these problems have occurred in the last 20, 30 years and the legislative framework hasn't kept up. And we acknowledge ourselves, we're struggling sometimes. We can legislate, for example, what's happening inside a chicken farm, but we have no legislative control, permitting control, and some of the things go outside, what comes off the site, etc. So the effort that's being put in by the companies we've talked about is huge. But again, you can't just regulate this to solution. It needs that coalition, we're all working together working together to try and find the optimal way of handling it. So without further ado, so I'm going to lose it totally in a minute. Over to my colleague. Right. Down? Down, apparently. Right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, last year, my colleague, Holly Sisley, came along and provided some detailed information about NRW and what we're doing on the River Wye. And tonight, I will try and summarise the timeline of the last five years and explain the why, the why from NRW's perspective. Uh, a key difference between England and Wales is that NRW is the statutory nature conservation body as well as the environmental regulator, whereas in England, these duties are carried out by Natural England and Environment Agency, respectively. Right, next slide. <laughs> uh, right, the challenge. Since 2019, the challenge facing the way has been brought into sharp focus. In 2020, we had floods, late winter and early spring, as a number of named storms hit, followed by a few months later by one of the worst droughts in many years. We've had significant algal blooms, um, and we saw a decline in some of the key features of the river, ranunculus, white, clawed crayfish, and some fish species. Uh, and we've also had several pollution incidents. And in early 2021, we published the report declaring that the Y was failing to meet its newly imposed and tighter limits for phosphate, and so become, became a failing Special Area of Conservation, or SAC. Next slide, please. Uh, once we started to understand the challenges and pressures of the, uh, on the YSAC, we also reported the following year, a further five Welsh rivers were also failing to meet their targets for phosphate. So we established a uh, SAC rivers project, looking at evidence, planning advice, and regulatory controls that were already in place to better understand what was going on and to develop solutions and controls to reduce phosphate loading in these catchments. The widely published SAGES model uh, indicated that on the Y, two thirds of the phosphate in the catchment was from land use, informing some targeted work on agricultural compliance across our key agricultural sectors. This has been complemented by some new legislation in Wales, the control of agriculture pollution regulations, <laughs> allowing us to create two new teams, two, two new agriculture teams, that are now assessing compliance with these regulations, these new regulations on higher risk farms. Um, we've also taken action on storm overflows and reviewed environmental permits. 
bringing in tighter limits where needed and we're working cross-border with our colleagues in both Environment Agency and Natural England and we're working collaboratively with other organisations through the Nutrient Management Board uh, and, and all this has gone on uh, alongside our routine regulation and enforcement work. Next slide, please. The, the challenges the why the River Y faces have many factors and are complex. And as mentioned earlier, we will not fix these by trying to solve them in isolation. We all have a role to play. Our climate is changing. It's getting warmer, wetter, drier, sunnier. Our population is growing, driving the need for food, housing and water and producing, producing more waste. There's no single solution, but a number of different approaches needed. We will continue our work monitoring, regulating and forcing, looking for ways to reduce these pressures. But we will also be looking at things differently, learning from the Tyvee catchment pilot for novel solutions. We're starting a significant project this year, the River Y Restoration Programme, which will run over five years, which will focus on restoring the features of the YSAC and increase the river's ecological resilience to the multiple pressures it faces. The project will visit 300 farms to identify uh, and remediate pollution sources, establish repairing corridors, uh, remove in-stream in barriers uh, to improve fish passage, control sections of non-native Himalayan balsam, and create at least 200 hectares of natural flood management measures. You'll be hearing much more from this project later on this year. And finally, which I really could do with the slide. I know, there was a good graph at the end, which is it just gone, Jimmy. I've not been given the slides. But the slides for LRW were sent, so I don't know if something went wrong. I'm so sorry, then, I don't, okay. then, then they're not here. Okay. I'm so sorry. If you can imagine a slide on the screen <laughs> from 1970 over to now. I want to leave you with this graph. We will send it out. We'll send it out. Which shows orthophosphate levels in the lower <coughs> end of the Y once the river flows back into Wales, at uh, the confluence of Walford Brook to Bigsbear Bridge. The graph shows the phosphate levels since 1970, with a red line indicating the new tighter phosphate level setting. Is, is this working? In, in 2019. Analysis of our most recent monitoring data on a three-year rolling average is shown that the level of orthophosphate has fallen below the target set in 2019 over the last two years. Whilst this is great news, it's one determinant at one location, and as I've said, the challenges being faced are far more than just phosphate levels at one site. But it's a positive I want to leave with. Thank you. Just, I think three very quick questions, and then that'll be it. But I wanted to know on that graph because you it said a glimmer of light as well. It said, and it showed that there was this lowering level. But do you have any idea why the phosphorus level fell in that one location? Because obviously, overall, as you know, the the river is in decline, and we've lost species. And it's not all about phosphorus, might be the answer, right? But there's all these other chemicals and all these other dangers and threats to the river. Maybe we're measuring the wrong thing. It's, it's never only been about phosphorus. I think phosphorus has been what's been in sharp focus because of the PSAC report and the failing, you know, that, that, that was what we declared the river as a failing sack. It was based on phosphorus. And that is one determinant. And, that, and you know, if we could see the graph, we would see that there, is, there actually isn't a great deal of headroom between the level of phosphorus that we're picking up now and the target. So this doesn't mean we can all relax and no, many, we've solved most areas are over the target. Uh, yes, the they are, yes, yeah. they are. Yes, they are. But I think yeah. the fact that this is actually so far down in the river system that we're actually starting to see some improvements, I think that ha we have to celebrate that. You know, because that is important. So the one thing, other thing I'd say is <clears throat> I understand the phosphate issue, but I always worry about microplastics, pharmaceuticals we really don't understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to find ourselves in this position in 10 years' time having an issue on pharma, pharma and microplastics. So we need to start thinking now about how we manage that. And your, your overall point is, and part of the reason for the, the tidy demonstrator, is we don't really understand enough about what's happening in our rivers. And that's where citizen science and all those sort of things can start. We can start gathering and understanding what makes things happen, what changes things. And we've got a huge amount of work to do on that. Mm -hmm.
On citizen science, I mean, we've been gathering data now for a number of years in this catchment. How is NRW going to use our data? Because the EA display it and there's, there's ways of they're interacting with it, at least a bit. But with NRW, we still don't really see any interaction with our data. Well, I think that's part of the demonstrator project in the time you actually, rather moving on just beyond showing it, thinking about how the, if you like, community, that involvement of volunteering can help understand what's really going on along the whole stretch of the river. I guess we are, I mean, we feel we are understanding it, we're making it all available. Oh, so you are here, yeah. like, uh, I said earlier on, I think the public sector pushes back at volunteering sometimes. Yeah. We need to start embracing volunteering and start thinking about volunteering and, and getting others to help us do some of the lifting on this, because we haven't got the resource base. You know, given the scale of responsibilities, get, frankly, given the Welsh budget situation, we haven't got the scale of resources. I think it's a fair point you raise, and I think to begin with, we were perhaps a little bit slow on the uptake with you know, some of the offerings from system scientists. I think that's changed and is still continuing to change. I know we're doing some good work with Pat Sterling, who I think is in the room here. You know, the, 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 I know the data is now hosted, and you're talking to our advisors in NRW about you know, how best we can use that data, and it is being used. So, so but we've, we've got some way to go, but I'm hoping that, that there has been that, that, that shift, and you've seen that shift. Um, and but yeah, I feel like we, you know, we stepped into that data gap to try and help you guys, and we'd like to see Absolutely. you use it more. Absolutely. And I guess the final question is about enforcement, as I gave Alan a tough time, and so did the audience. When are we going to see enforcement from NRW? And if we're not seeing it now, what does it take? Is it about funding or is it about management? Like, what needs to change for you to start enforcing the law? So my view of this, the board's view, is that regulation and enforcement isn't just an answer on its own. The best form of regulation is self-regulation. And you've seen that in many industries where actually the industry itself, the industry itself produces the solutions. Now that's not going to happen on its own. It needs to drive us to make that happen. And regulation and enforcement is one of those drivers. So we need to work out more clearly how we change farming. And Welsh farming is in a, a very, very tough situation at the moment. It's not like English farming is still side of the line. It's in a very tough situation facing frankly, a very big challenge economically, particularly changing farm payment scheme and all the rest of it. So there's no clear answer here. We will do more and more, we are doing more and more in regulation and enforcement, we will do that. But on its own, it's not the answer. We have to think more radically about how we feel like change the model here, or how we work with collegiately to shift, that, to shift the dial on it. I think that people here would have huge sympathy for farmers, and I think farmers have a really tough life, and they get very little money, and they deal with great uncertainty, and I think there'll be huge sympathy in the room. But actually, enforcing regulation is fairer for, for, for farmers. Because if there's, a, if there's consistent regulation, then that's a fair playing field for everybody. Absolutely. Whereas at the moment, the farmers that are trying to do good work say, well, I'm spending money on this extra manure store, and I'm spending money on this mitigation, but my neighbour is just chucking his shit all over there. And because there's no penalty for that, I'm paying a financial price. Okay. So actually, if you did the enforcement, it might make things better and fairer for farmers, and we should all pay <laughs> Facing an industry, particularly in Wales, which is facing very dire Our consequences. Our river is dying. We need you to regulate. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Thank you very much for being here. Really good job. I'd just briefly like to say thank you very much to all our presenters for coming along this evening and giving us such an informative uh, set of slides. So thank you all very much. And secondly, please, uh, a big thank you to Nicola Kutcher. in the Guardian next week. Um, uh, yeah, no, thanks very much indeed, Nicola. Thank you all very much for your patience this evening, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed it and found um, it useful. Thank you.
please take a moment and enjoy this last song on behalf of the River Wye. Now flow forth and let the river Y flow through your hearts. 